Portland Conservancy. And this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to this presentation by Ian Burrow on the topic of Native Americans in the Sourlands. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, we have a full house tonight on this call. Our meeting technical host, Karina, uh, she's our, actually our bouncer. Uh, she has the audio of all of us, all of you muted while we listen to the talk so there won't be any distractions like, like when your dog barks like mine would do. Uh, I believe you're all free to turn on or off your own video, however. Our speaker, Ian, will be presenting slides and materials for about an hour. And then after that, we'll have a brief question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question, type your name or your question into the chat bar. And uh, when this is over, uh, uh, one of us will call on you and then you'll be able to unmute yourself and uh, we'll have a discussion. I'll repeat this part when the talk is over. This talk is being recorded so that we may offer it on our website to other people. So uh, please go ahead and welcome recommend it to your friends. So I would like to introduce our wonderful speaker tonight, who is Ian Burrow. Ian is an archaeologist and cultural resource management professional who lives here in the Sourlands. Between 1988 and 2015, Ian was vice president and principal archaeologist at Hunter Research in Trenton, investigating numerous 18th and 19th century historic sites up and down the eastern seaboard. Active in leadership of national professional organizations, Ian has also taught at the college level at Drew, Rutgers, Ryder, and the University of Delaware. In 2015, Ian founded his own company, Burrow Into History, LLC, whose mission is to improve the preservation, management, and public enjoyment of historic cultural resources in the United States and beyond. So now I will turn it over to Ian. Okay, thanks, Beverly. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for thank you for turning out on this dark winter evening, um, and uh, coming down to the train station. No, um, it's rather uh, it, it's interesting the way we've now adapted to doing things in this in this way. Um, one thing that we said, I think, in the publicity material for this talk is that if, if you have any um, uh, Native American um, American Indian artifacts that are from this, from the Sal and region that you that you know of. Um, I uh, would be most interested to obviously to see them and to uh, and to tell you what they are as far as I can do that. Um, uh, one of my other hats, I'm also on the board of the Hopewell Museum, and we have quite a nice um, uh, Indian artifact collection uh, there, which we're hoping to catalogue and present much more. Uh, interestingly than it has perhaps been in the past. Um, but I'm very interested in finding out because I, I know I always hear stories that people, oh, I have something that, you know, my uncle found and it's on the windowsill, oh, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I'll be showing you a couple of artifacts like that a bit later on, actually, which were found on the Sowlands. So um, uh, if anybody has anything, maybe we might be able to see them at the end of this as part of the Q&A, uh, or, or um, you can email me with pictures or, or anything. Anyway, so let's let's uh, so let's get started. So, well, um, it's pretty certain we can say that um, American Indians or Native Americans, whichever phrase you work is you use, is fine. Recently, the American Indians I have talked to have said they like to be called American Indians, so that's what I call them. But Native Americans is okay. Um, um, uh, anyway, they these. Uh, people have been living in the Sowland region for at least 8,000 years and possibly longer than that, but we'll see. Uh, we may find out at some point. But at least at least 8,000 years, the ancestors of the of the Lenape people um, have been in this in this part of the world. So it's a good long time and it's a good long time for different things to have happened and for things to have changed and um, and things to have been done and hopefully we'll eventually find out more about what those were. So I had two questions when I was thinking about this 
uh, talk this evening, sort of how, how did uh, American Indians use the Sowland Mount and how did they, uh, what, what did they, what did they do on it, if you like? And the second question, which is more difficult to answer, is did they see it as somewhat, in some way, different from the areas around it? You know, we, we certainly do. Um, those of us who, uh, who uh, are, you know, Sourland aware, you know, we, we see Sourland Mountain on, on, you know, on the horizon when, we, when we're driving along 518 and, and, and we know it's this highland area that's rather unique in New Jersey and, and, and stands out certainly in this part of central New Jersey, um, topographically as a, as, a, as a prominent feature. And, you know, so I found myself wondering, did American Indians have any perception of it as a different or a special place? There may be some clues that they did, as we'll see a bit later on. Anyway, we're a long way from definite answers to those questions, but I always think it's worth posing them anyway. Um, so I wanted to start with one of the classic images of <coughs> American Indians in this part of North America. Um, this is from Benjamin West's famous painting of the death of General Wolfe at Quebec, uh, which was painted in 1770 before the American Revolution. And uh, in that picture, he included this image of a <coughs> American Indian ally of the British uh, this is guy is probably an Iroquois, in fact, not, not a, a lot of Delaware or a Lenape, but um, gives us a good sense of what um, these warriors looked like in the period of, you know, the late 1600s and up to the time of the revolution. Um, and um, this man is, is, um, is really a classic guy. He, he's showing all the things. Benjamin West obviously decided to make sure he had everything that he should have. So as you can see, he has a lot of tattoos uh, on his legs and upper arms and on his uh, head and face. His head is shaved and painted red. Um, he's wearing a trade blanket, probably made in Stroud in Gloucestershire in the Cotswolds of England. Um, he has a musket on which he's decorated uh, and a pipe tomahawk probably made in Birmingham in England. <laughs> and um, so he is a perfect example of how the uh, Eastern Indians, um, you know, adapted their culture to, to deal with the new reality of Europeans um, amongst them. And it gives us some sense of uh, what you might have seen if you saw a local Lenape warrior in this area, perhaps in the, in the early 1700s. But we do have some other images as well. Um, uh, and and this, is, this is one of them. This is one of a series of really local American Indians, real Lenape Indians, uh, our Indians, if you like, um, painted in the 1730s by uh, this guy, Gustavus Heselius, who was a Swede originally, um, but um, became quite a popular painter in the, Amer the mid-Atlantic colonies and he painted a series of these um, Indian sachems, uh, leaders, we don't really call them chiefs exactly, but the elder leaders, wise people, the guiders of the, of the, of the people if you like, um, uh, usually at the time when they're coming to do some negotiation over land transfers from the Indians to the colonists. And that's what got the context here, 1737. Um, and again, we see a blanket, a trade blanket. These were extremely prized artifacts. Uh, they were cheaper, easier, and probably somewhat warmer to carry around than traditional fur blankets um, and um, could be obtained through trade. Um, he also ha he has a, a medicine pouch around his neck, which probably has important things in it, including probably tobacco, but also some other amulets and charms that are important to him. And he also has tattoos, as you can see. Uh, so these were probably very, very common um, um, feature to see. So this, is, these, this gives us some sense of what the first Europeans in this area um, saw when, when they arrived here in the in the late 1600s. 
Well, let's jump right back to the earliest times now. Um, the earliest dates for human beings in North America is still being, it's a very active topic. Um, and the dates are kind of being pushed back, pushed back um, um, all the time. Um, and, um, but the, the first really um, sort of clear culture at the moment that we see um, in Eastern North America is, is typified by this uh, object called a Clovis type projectile point. Um, and um, this is quite a big thing. It's probably about three or four inches long. They vary quite a lot, but something like that. Um, and its distinctive uh, feature is this um, flute, what we call the flute, the way that a flake has been struck off down, down the base to help with hafting it onto some kind of a shaft. And um, these objects are around 10,000 to 12,000 uh, years old. And um, they sort of come right at the end of the Ice Age. The, some of the big Ice Age animals are still around, like mastodons and mammoths and things, um, when these uh, people appear. They certainly get into New Jersey, um, but we haven't, we haven't found one of these um, on Salem Mountain or even, in, or even in the area around, as far as I know. But there, there are a number of them um, from New Jersey, and maybe one day one will be found on, on Salem Mountain, which will push our, our dates back for us. But this is the actual oldest artifact that I've been able to identify around here so far. And it's in the Hopewell Museum collection. And you can see it's much smaller than the, than the Clovis point. It's only just over an inch um, in length. It, it's made of a, uh, what we call a roseate or pink uh, quartz material. And uh, it's called a LaCroix point. These names are given to them by archaeologists because of you know, where they found them first or where they first identified them or the um, name of somebody's grandmother. Or, or, there's all kinds of reasons why they get these different names, but usually it's related to some location where they were first um, you know, really identified. Anyway, so this one is about 8,000 years old and the distinctive thing about it is that here, here's the base where the, you know, the shaft would be attached, has these little sort of ears coming out and this indented uh, base and the shoulders uh, coming up here. There's a great wide variety of different types of projectile points, as we call them. We don't call them arrowheads because some of them are spearheads, some of them are arrowheads, and some of them are other tools as well. So um, if you want to sound really knowledgeable and, you know, make people feel, you know, that you're, in, you're, you're on top of things, you say, oh, no, no, it's not an arrowhead, it's, it's a projectile point. Um, Anyway, so this is a projectile point, um, and it's a LaCroix. So this is, this is about um, uh, 8,000 years old, um, so pretty respectable. And, you know, are there others from around here? There, there, there may be. I, I don't know. I, I, own, I can only know what I've seen in the museum collection and a few other pieces that people have, have, have showed me. So one of the purposes of these uh, kind of talks for me is I, I, I hope to make contact with people who actually have some other artifacts that we can really begin to build up an idea of where things are being found or have been found um, in the past. Okay. Um, so here's a familiar map, the Sowland Mountain. Um, the yellow outline is the Sowland region as it's sort of defined. Um, and the um, red stars with the blue outlines are the approximate locations of American Indian artifact finds as recorded um, by the New Jersey State Museum, which is the sort of main recording location for this kind of, of information. <clears throat> and um, you sort of look at it and say, okay, yeah, well, um, one thing you do see straight away is, is that there's a concentration along the Delaware River la la around Lambertville and south of Lambertville and also along the north side, along the streams that run along the north side of Salem Mountain here. There's a few in the sort of 31 corridor here. Here's Route 31. And then there's a, a few along the south side along the Bedensbrook 
uh, other tributaries of the millstone and as you might expect on on Stony Brook. But we have to sort of ask, you know, what, what does a distribution map like this uh, really mean? And, and of course, what it means is it means it's places where people have found stuff. And usually most of these things have, found, have been found in the past um, by farmers, by people plowing, plowing the fields and, and picking up the artifacts. And, and, and uh, so it's not surprising perhaps that there isn't anything on the, right on the top of Salem Mountain here where plowing is really very difficult, as you probably know. Um, so in many ways, it, 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 it's not necessarily telling us the only places where American Indians were. In fact, I'm sure it doesn't show us that, but it does show us some of the places where they definitely were, uh, but we can expect to fill in some of the gaps uh, as research goes along. Now that's the first, the first uh, map with the sites on, and I'm going to show you a couple of, of other ones uh, with sort of different backgrounds. So here's the one of the showing the actual topography and the drainages, which is, you know, uh, a very helpful way of looking at the landscape, of course. And um, this is from the um, very important uh, Banish study that really sort of put the Salans on the map in the 1980s, Laurie, something like that, 1980s, thank you. Um, so does this give us any more information? Well, yes, it, I think it does. I mean, again, it shows us that they're really, the, the high, the really high ground of Salem Mountain, coming down here, and also including Baldpate Mountain and Pennington Mountain. Um, uh, no, nothing much has been found up there. I mean, really nothing, in fact. Um, um, and again, we think, well, that's perhaps not unreasonable because these areas are less hospitable, surely, to most people, including American Indians. So, so maybe that's a real thing. Now you may be asking, what are these two white blobs here? The, these are, I wish I hadn't made them quite so prominent, but um, these are the locations, and we'll come back to these later, of uh, two of the uh, Lenape villages that we know were here in the late 1600s. This one here is Nenapanascon, and this one here is Wissaminson. And there were, uh, I'm getting hints, there was probably at least one or two more um, over here also, but the, we know these exist because they're mentioned in European documents uh, as places that, you know, as villages, as places uh, with Indian names. Um, so we're, uh, from this map, we're already getting, getting a hint that, yeah, there's some definite actual settlements, certainly late on, you know, at the time of European settlement on the southern flanks of Sally Mountain too. You're going to get sick of seeing maps of Sowland Mountain, but this is the third one for the moment. And this shows um, uh, the sites again in relation to the solid geology, the rock that's underneath. And, you know, as I'm sure many of you know, the reason that there is a Sowland Mountain is because of this Jurassic diabase, the red stuff which is the, you know, the makes the big rocks and boulders and, and the uh, vernal pools and the the, the slow drainage and the inhospitable, difficult landscape that, that we associate with, with Sal and Mountain. And of course, it also occurs out on um, Bullpate Mountain and, and Pennington and with Monster Mountains um, down here. Um, well, you see, there are a couple of sites that sort of actually are on this stuff. So, you know, you have to wonder what, what, what's going on with that. So, so they are actually on what we might think of as the inhospitable bits. Um, but I'd like to draw your attention mostly to this green um, uh, formation, the Lokatong formation. This is the um, argillite material, um, which is very commonly used by American Indians um, over thousands of years for um, stone tools, including projectile points and, and many other kinds of, of stone tools. Um, because it, it's, um, it's a sort of stone that you can really chip away and make very sharp and, um, and, and, and really do things with. And, and uh, although when you leave it in the ground for hundreds of years, it gets very soft 
and erode. So when you see projectile points, hundreds of years old made of this, they look really blunt and dull and boring and awful. But when, when they're freshly made, when a, a freshly made piece of argillite can almost cut your finger off. It's very, very sharp material when you break it in the right way. And so, um, so argillite, I think, is, is one immediate resource that we can see that um, American Indians would have come to the Salon Mountains for. Um, it doesn't just occur here, it occurs in other places as well. It occurs up um, around uh, north of Flemington, as you can see here, this is Salon Mountain. The bit of it stretches out over to the uh, Raritan Bay over here, there's some of it over in Pennsylvania. And there are also different other kinds of stone that um, American Indians used uh, for, for tools as well. But argillite is a very popular uh, material. It actually outcrops along the Delaware River here, so it's really easy to obtain. But it's very easy to obtain on Sal and Mountain too, because it's exposed in the stream beds. You don't need to go and make a, an argillite quarry. You just sort of go wander around in the, in the bed of the stream until you find a piece that, that, that looks about the right size for the artifact that you're trying to make. So, so it's a very, I'm sure it was a very commonly used um, <coughs> place, com a commonly frequented place for getting good argillite for, for new tools. Maps, maps, maps. Okay, this is just a close up uh, showing where, where the local argillite is in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So here, here's Sal and Mountain, the, the uh, argillite for Sal and Mountain. Here's the north of Flemington and across the Delaware River into Pennsylvania piece, and this little bit that trails its way up. Um, you know, over to the <clears throat> Raritan Bay area there. I expect many of you have seen this wrote this sign, this historic marker on Route 31 um, near the Pine Ridge, um, Pine, Pine Ridge, anyway, the golf course there. Um, I'm not quite sure why this was put in this particular location because it's on Route 31, which is a sort of corridor, you know, a gap between the higher parts of Salem Mountain to the east and, uh, and the somewhat lower parts to the west, but it's actually placed, placed at a location where there isn't any argillite. Um, so anyway, but it's there and it's a, little, it's a little reminder to people as they go past here that uh, um, American Indians were here and, and were using, using the argillite. So um, whoever put this up, thank you very much. And this is a view of, of what argillite looks like. This is actually, of course, in a in uh, one of the many stone walls um, crisscrossing the landscape on Salon Mountain, but you get a good sense of it as sort of slabby kind of stone, has this sort of um, greenish gray appearance very often where it's been weathered, but it'll be almost like a blue gray um, inside. And apparently it's had a traditional name around here of blue jingle, because fresh argillite, when you drop it, it makes a jingly noise because it's sort of hard and, and brittle. Um, so, um, so that's, that's one resource that we can be, I think, almost certain was being um, made use of on, on Sala Mountain. And of course we have artifacts from this area actually made from it. Um, and um, here's, here's two of them, and these are particularly exciting because they've, they've come to my attention, as it were, uh, and therefore to the museum's attention um, in the last uh, few years, um, um, just through personal contact. The, 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 the bottom act, the two views of this one at the bottom, uh, are from the Katzenbach farm up on 518. Um, and um, this one up here uh, was found on the property of Benita Grant, who's the um, um, archivist for the Hopewell Museum, and um, brought it in and said, is this anything? And yeah, yes, it is something. Um, so what, what are these things? They are um, a very common type of artifact um, uh, all over the mid-Atlantic region, really. And um, they're, they're, we call them axes because that's probably their primary um, function. Um, this one at the top has quite a nice uh, axe edge here, as you can see, 
uh, and they usually have a, 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 a butt end, which in many cases you can also see as being used uh, probably as a hammer, perhaps to hit a wedge uh, in, a, in a piece of wood. This one the, uh, has been broken, that's why it's been thrown away. The, 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 the axe bit end, the sharp end, has, 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 has broken on impact. Um, and you can see that the, the butt end has been used and is kind of battered there. Um, and these grooves that you see around them, they've been produced by pecking, not, not these, these, these um, tools are not made by flaking, they're made by pecking and grinding. You take another stone and you go, tick, 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 tick. you had a lot of time on your hands and probably you could have interesting conversations and do all kinds of other things while you're doing this. Um, um, and you're making grooves, obviously, to hold these stone objects into some kind of organic wooden or fiber um, handle, which of course has long since decayed away. And um, they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes um, uh, and some, some minor variations on where the groove is. You can see this one, the groove is right at the back here. It's pretty much in the middle. Um, sometimes the groove goes all the way around. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there are two grooves. Um, there's a whole range of you know, a, a, vari a variety of the way that you could make these things. And that's not surprising because we think they were probably in use um, for about 3000 years. I mean, this type of tool was being made and used over a period from about 6,000 to at least 3000 years ago, probably, probably a bit later when it sort of evolved into a slightly different kind of, of artifact. So this is a very, very, this is obviously a very effective good tool because people go on using it for literally thousands of years. Um, uh, by the way, this one here was found in Woodsville in Benita Grant's backyard. Um, so what, do, what are these things um, trying to tell us? Well, first of all, you know, they, there's a time when they didn't exist before 6,000 years ago or so, and then they did. So something changed. Somebody thought, hey, look, we can make these things. Uh, and they must have had some particular reason for, for adopting this tool into their, you know, tool kit, if you like to call it that. What, 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 were, they, what were they wanting to do? Well, well the, the, the conventional view is, and I think it's probably right, is that, is that you're moving into a time when the forests are really getting to be very dense and everywhere, and people are needing, wanting to use the resources of the forest more than perhaps they had been before, particularly the timber resources. Um, and so we envisage people um, using these axes uh, primarily as wood management tools. I mean, people see them say, oh, tomahawk. I mean, obviously they could be used as a weapon, um, but, but I think the reality is that they are a, an everyday tool that you expected to have, and you could use it to, to chop trees and limbs down. There have been experiments done with these in Europe and actually they're quite surprisingly effective at cutting down small trees. Not, not big ones, but you know, sort of saplings and trees up to about, almost up to a foot in diameter can be felled quite easily with these two, well, when you know how to use them, um, with, the, with these tools. And of course the back, as I've said, you can use as a hammer. And one obvious application of that is if you're trying to split logs, uh, you put some kind of wedge in the log and you, you, you hit the wedge with the butt end of the axe. So it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a double, a double purpose um, uh, kind of tool. So what we think we're seeing here is an increasing, should we say, mastery of the woodlands. Um, they can use the wood for a variety of things um, and almost certainly are starting to make things like um, dugout canoes and probably, you know, better shelters perhaps than, than, than had previously been the case uh, and, and using wood for a, a lot of other purposes that we can't often know because the wood, of course, doesn't survive from this long ago, except in really exceptional um, circumstances. Here's a couple of other examples to give you a sense of the range and, and what happens to them later on in time. These are, uh, uh, um, see these don't have grooves on them. You see they're, they're not grooved. Um, 
um, and uh, archaeologists call these uh, celts, C-E-L-T-S. I'm not quite sure why, but anyway, they do. Um, uh, so this is a very big one. You see it's over 12 inches long. Uh, it, this is made of basalt or some other very dense stone. Um, and here's a, a little tiny um, argillite one, which is only about three inches long um, uh, down here. These are both in the museum collection. Again, we don't know exactly where they're from, but they are, they are from the Sauland region, the, bro the broader Sauland region, probably Hopewell Township or Montgomery, um, we think from the records that we have in the museum. But there's every reason to suspect these things would have been being used actually on the Sauland Mountain. Um, as well. And this is how you put handles on the, on the grooved ones. Um, uh, we know this partly because in some parts of the country where you get very good preservation of organic materials like Florida, for example, or very dry conditions out in the American Southwest, um, these things actually do survive sometimes. So you can actually see exactly how it was done. Typically, you're, you're sort of looping something around the top and then tying it tightly with um, hide, raw hide, letting it tighten as it dries, um, and using glues and all kinds of other cords and binding devices to hold them, hold them tight. <clears throat> you can also put little wedges of wood in there like shims to keep them, keep them nice and tight. With the celts, the ones I just showed you, um, we, the, we think they usually had a, a, a thicker piece of wood and put a hole through it and then just jammed jammed the celt uh, in there and then probably lashed it to the top to stop it splitting. Um, but you can imagine uh, there are probably people in all these societies, particular individuals who are particularly good at this. So there's some differentiation of job going on. Some said, look, I need a new axe, but I'm hopeless at making them. If I give you, you know, um, three otter skins, will you make one for me? You know, that kind of thing um, going on. As the, the, the best people uh, at doing particular jobs. <clears throat> then as time goes on, we start to see um, slightly different um, kinds of tools appearing. Um, as you can see, what the, the main feature of these rather dull looking stones, is they do have these sort of little ears on them, as you can see, and a little ridge uh, down them. Now, instead of being, <coughs> excuse me, instead of being uh, like an axe, you know, if you look at an axe sideways on, it's sort of like that, both sides you know, with, with the tip there, they're, they're sort of symmetrical. These things are flat on one side and curved on the other. So we're seeing the curved sides of these here, and the underneath is much more flat. Now, these objects are adzes, A-D-Z, S, adzes, yes, adzes. And they are a carpenter's tool. And their primary use is you, you mount them this way and you use them like a, like a chisel, if you like. They're, they're, they're a carving out of hollow wood tool. And you can also use them for trimming the outsides of things. So again, these would be very much what we'd expect to being, being used in the um, manufacture of, of um, dugout canoes and that kind of thing, or big tubs for, for grinding uh, food into and things like that. Uh, so these are fairly common too. We have, I mean, I forget exactly, but we've got well over a dozen of these in the museum. And these, these little objects also give us a very good idea of, of um, how they were found and where they came from. You see these scratches across them well, those are the marks of a plowshare. So they've been struck by the plow in a field and uh, pulled up by the plow and, and, um, and retrieved by the person behind the plow. And um, so, so many of these artifacts were found and collected um, this way. So, you know, we're seeing, we're, we're, we're sort of gradually sort of easing our way through time here. We're probably getting now down to around about 2000 years ago or so uh, with these kind of, um, of artifacts. And um, at this point, I want to 
get away from the sort of everyday activity, you know, um, procuring food, hunting. I haven't talked much about hunting, but of course the projectile points uh, that we find were mostly, again, used for that, for hunting deer and other, other animals, wild fowl and so on. And the other thing that we must not forget, of course, is, is wild plant foods. Um, at this stage, say 2,000 years ago or so, there's no actual agriculture going on. Um, so you're, you're living a, what we call a hunter-gathering kind of lifestyle, but that makes it sound as if it's kind of rather tough and hand-to-mouth. Um, whereas the reality probably was that these people knew very well where everything was and at what time of the year you went there to get it. So nuts and other, you know, the whole range of plants, some of them to eat, some of them for medicinal purposes, and some of them undoubtedly up on uh, parts of Salem Mountain. I think this is something we could do a lot more research on, different types of uh, plants that were of importance to American Indians, and are that, where, where, where do they occur um, on Salem Mountain? That would be a, a very fun thing to, to do, I think. So, so um, I think we have to um, imagine that these people have a very well established way of life and a, and a yearly round. They're moving around probably in a reasonably small area, you know, I don't know, maybe about the size of Hopewell Township or something like that, um, on a regular kind of regular schedule um, and collecting different kinds of foods and hunting different kinds of animals, going to the river to fish, um, uh, in a very kind of um, familiar kind of way. They would know their landscape extremely well um, and have a great familiarity with everything about it. Um, and this is where I'm going to start sneaking in some discussion of, well, what, how did they, what did they think about this landscape? And of course, getting to find out what people thought 2000 plus years ago is very difficult. Um, but it, in a way, it's what archaeologists are charged with trying to do. Um, and um, so, so I'm going to sort of look a little bit now at some of the sort of more less hand-to-mouth kind of views of, of the Salem Mountains that, that um, American Indians may have had. <clears throat> some of you may well be familiar with this very famous monument in Ohio, uh, the Great Serpent Mound, um, which um, is one of a whole series of different kinds of earthworks that were particularly common in the Ohio and Mississippi Valley, not so much out in this area, but, but many different kinds of, of things. And this is probably the most famous, although there are effigies of bears and all kinds of other things. And um, as you can see, this, this thing is pretty substantial. Here are the, the walking trails around it. There's the steps. I think it's about 2,000 feet long, I think. I forget exactly. Anyway, it's a very big thing. And you can see it's made of piling up earth into the serpent shape. And at this end, you have a sort of complication here, which is sometimes thought of being a, a serpent's head holding an egg. That's one of the... One of the interpretations is given on it, and over this end it has a nice curly tail. Um, so, you know, what this tells us is that, of course, that uh, no surprise, American Indians were well able to um, modify the landscape. Sorry about the noise, it's my cat. Um, modify the landscape by, um, you know, digging up dirt or rearranging stones or um, anything they pretty much wanted to turn their mind to. Um, and so there is no reason at all why this kind of thing um, should not have been going on uh, in the Salem Mountains, perhaps. Um, no, no, no guarantee, but, but um, um, there's no question that um, American Indians had and have uh, a very strong spiritual life uh, and cosmology, if you like, and, and beliefs about the world and the natural world and the supernatural world and, and all that stuff, and um, that they were able to devote energies to it. They're not living hand to mouth. There is time, 
and resources to do things like this. So with that in mind, um, we now jump to back to the Sal and Mountains, the Sal and Mountain. Um, I, I should say this, we, this, this particular effigy is thought to be about a thousand years old, but they are being built in, uh, in the Midwest anywhere between 2000 and 1000 years ago. So that, that sort of, sort of time frame over there. So, when you walk around on the many wonderful preserved areas on Salmon Mountain, um, it's very hard to avoid seeing stones. <laughs> there are lots of stones. Um, but in, and, and many of these stones, of course, turn out to be field walls um, uh, built in the late 18th, 19th centuries, um, primarily uh, to delineate cow pastures for the most part. Um, but not everything that you see fits into that category. And um, some of us are beginning to think that there are more things up there than just field walls. There are also, of course, the sites of old farmsteads and things like that. Um, but maybe there are earlier things too. And this is, this is one example of a sort of puzzling thing. This is at Pride's Point Preserve, um, next to the Alex Orkin Creek Wildlife Management Area, where there's a very nice mill dam and a, um, a, a still a house and some other ruins and all kinds of interesting stuff. And then um, sort of a little way west of where the house is and along by the Alex Orkin Creek is this big flat topped um, rectangle, sub rectangular pile of stones. And uh, it's about two and a half feet high, I suppose, and I forget the measurements. I'm not, it's about probably 25 feet long and maybe 10 feet uh, wide. And um, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and also in this area at Pride's Point, there are some very odd little things that look a bit like stone walls, but don't make any sense as making fields because they, sometimes they're in a kind of V shape and come together, making an utterly tiny and ridiculous little area that wouldn't work as a field at all. Um, so, um, you know, we have to ask, well, who is doing this and, and why? There could be a very ordinary explanation for something like this. Uh, somebody was doing some quarrying and they decided to to pile the stone up here, but it is quite deliberate looking actually and, um, and, and, and quite noticeable as you walk along the trail over to the left uh, here. So that's, that's in Pride's Point, but the more um, compelling thing to me is along the Rock Hopper Trail, which is over towards Lambertville, as you may well know. It, it, um, not all that many people know this trail, which is it's an absolutely wonderful trail. It takes you uh, through wonderful uh, woodlands and then past amazing uh, stone walls and all kinds of other things. And um, one time when I was walking through here, the trail actually comes right through here. I looked to my left and my right and I saw a distinct winding line of stones. Now this is on the diabase. This is the, you know, this is rugged sal and topography. There are boulder fields just off to the right and uh, it's pretty rugged. Over to the left up the hill has been a lot of quarrying in the 19th century um, and um, activity going on up there. But this didn't to me look quite like that. It doesn't look like a wall. Uh, there are not many walls built on the diabase areas anyway, in my experience. Um, and this is much too low. It's only one or two courses high. In one place, I think there's three stones piled across, 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 on top, on top of each other. And as you can see, it wiggles across the landscape. Um, this pole is marked off in feet, so get some idea. And this is my good uh, collaborator. Uh, Mr. Ludicky, Patrick Ludicky, standing as a photographic scale. And then in the background, right there to his right, well, to his left, to on the right of him, 
is the other end of this thing than the other scale pole over there. And if you look at this end, you can see that the, it sort of expands out. Instead of being almost just a single line, it sort of expands out into a sort of sort of lozenge-shaped area, and there's another stone um, lying here. Now, I spent quite a lot of time thinking about whether this was a, an artifact, you know, a thing made by people, or could it be something, you know, produced by natural, you know, geological you know, processes or something. But the more I uh, looked at it and the more I talked to other people and read up uh, research of a kind that's being done particularly in New England, um, I began to think that there was a good possibility that this thing is uh, an artifact. It's an artificially created stone alignment. Here's another view of it. We went up with a nice leaf blower to blow the things off. Partly to see, well, were we just seeing some of what was it? Was it a whole mass of stones all around here? It wasn't really a real thing, but we were quite sure. You can see there are really no stones here or here. And here it is. Here's the, the expanded end I just showed you. And here it winds away back towards the photographer um, here. And then this is looking from the, the far end, uh, where we, the pole that we saw in the distance, there's a very big flat rock here, which seems to be an end, and here are the stones winding away. This enormous tree has grown over the top of it and probably pushed the stones sideways. Um, so that gives us, if we can date this tree, which we can do by measuring it and so on, it gives us um, what archaeologists call a terminus antiquem, uh, before which that, this thing was here. In other words, uh, this tree started to grow after this thing was here. So if this tree is 150 years old, this must be at least 150 years old. That's the sort of logic that we can uh, use on this. Um, and so I would not have seen this had it not been right on the trail. So it does make you wonder, are there more of these things around? And, and I, I, I'm, I'm almost certain that, that some people on this uh, talk this evening have, have, have seen other ones as well, I think. And, and I think we're on to something uh, rather interesting here. So um, this is a, a quick map that I, I made of it. I didn't draw every stone because it would have taken me a long time. Um, um, but I have got um, vertical photographs of the whole length of this thing. But here's the, um, what we might dare to call the head end here. And there's the big boulder at the other end. And here are the stones winding, 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 winding. But, well, let's go back to that. Um, so, um, I think, and uh, you know, uh, there's been a lot more research on this kind of feature in New England than there has been anywhere in New Jersey or anywhere else in the mid-Atlantic except some areas of Pennsylvania. But in New England there are large, as, as, as you probably, if you visited New England, you only have to go into the woods a little bit and you're falling over stone walls all over the place, again from abandoned farms from the uh, 1800s, but there are also other things like this in the woods in New England, um, particularly cairns, that is piles of rocks, some of which may certainly be to do with agriculture, with clearing the land for farming and so on, but other ones don't seem to fit into that uh, category at all and seem to be um, deliberate constructions. Um, so what I think is that possible, I'm going way out on the limb here now, um, but I think it's possible that these diabase areas of Sowell and Mountain, the highest areas, the most rugged areas, the weirdest areas with these big rock outcrops and, and, and things, um, may have been seen as a special kind of place. There's not going to be a whole lot of wild game up here. Uh, there's not going to be much that you want to obtain from this type of landscape. Maybe some plants and things, maybe some hunting, but it's not really a very rich environment, but it is unusual 
it's high, it has these weird rocks all over it, and you can move them around fairly easily because a lot of them are movable out sort of size. So um, I think it's, so what, what I'm saying here is that we have, um, there's a research opportunity here to explore the hypothesis that the diabase areas of Salem Mountain had a spiritual significance to some American Indians. That's about as far as I could, would take it right now. But, but this, this thing to me was, is so convincing. When you see it and, and, and walk along it, it's, it's clearly not natural. It is an artifact. And I can't see it really fitting into um, a European, you know, Euro-American Euro context. It, it looks American Indian to me. I can't prove it. I cannot prove it at this point. We might be able to do that in various ways. But so it's only a hypothesis, but I think it's something that's worth um, uh, talking about. Um, how are we doing for time, Beverly? We all right? All right for time? Okay. Sorry. We have another about 10 minutes or so, Ian. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to bring this, uh, having left you with that hopefully tantalizing idea, I just want to bring sort of things up to, you know, what happens um, in the last few centuries before and while Europeans are arriving. Well, we, we know, again, from the accounts written by early European uh, colonists, settlers, um, um, that Indians, the American Indians on the East Coast are living in agricultural villages. Not everywhere, but in many places. Um, they, they are now building uh, wigwam type buildings like this, um, typically in varying sizes and shapes and designs and materials. But this kind of thing, and they're living in small villages where you'd have a number of these houses, you know, scattered about. Um, and we should probably think of these villages as sort of um, probably kin groups, probably little, you know, people's all some way related to each other. Um, and they probably view themselves as part of wider groupings, clans, and this group that we, you know, the Lenape, the Lene Lenape, um, the people of the land. Um, they probably felt themselves akin to many other people. They spoke the same languages and dialects and lived the same kind of lifestyle. Um, but there's no very strong political organization, probably, really. Um, there are leaders who are respected and are listened to, um, and meetings can be grouped together, called together at various times. But, but we're, we're, it's a fairly, what should we say, a small scale agricultural society. And these kind of artifacts are the ones that we um, tend to find around Hopewell. Again, not on Salem Mountain, as far as I know yet, but maybe that's not likely. These are hoes. These are, this is, these are women's tools. These are female tools. We, we try nowadays to engender the artifacts. Who used these tools? We know, again, from anthropological studies and early accounts, that the women are the ones that do the cultivating. The men prepare the ground, they dig up the roots and, 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 and mess it all around, and, but it's the women that do the actual cultivating of the crops and one of the things they use are these hoes. So you would not see probably a man, hand, even handling one of these things, was probably a taboo thing to do. Um, and um, so, you know, what, what's good to me about these artifacts is we're actually, hey, there are women here as well. You know, we tend to think of you know all the images are of males. You know, the chiefs, the warriors. Less. The women are are here, obviously, and they're they the ones who grow the crops. They're the one who grow the main food. The men are off, you know, hunting and doing masculine stuff like that. But but um, but the everyday food you ate was probably produced <laughs> by the women, um, and. Um, so these are, these are, although they're rather, they look rather crude in a way, they're not usually very finely made because they didn't last long. You know, you're hitting the ground with them and, and they're gonna break and you're gonna need another one. So you're not gonna spend large amounts of time 
on manufacturing them because you can make a new one uh, fairly readily. Again, most of these are made of, of argillite, as you might expect. Um, and again, these are from the, um, from the Hope Farm Museum. So we have a small scale a society, people uh, hunting, but, but, but farming, growing, I think of it more as like gardening, really, but more like organic gardening, if you like. The, 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 the fields that they have are, more, we more think of like as a, as a large garden, really. Um, but, and they're growing maize, beans and squashes, um, mostly. Um, and they're probably also still collecting wild plants, nuts and all that kind of thing at the right uh, time of year. They're trading with other people and, um, and not particularly uh, warlike. I mean, the, the Lenape are not renowned um, as being particularly um, warlike, particularly in comparison with people like the Susquehannocks to the west and the Iroquois and the Huron to the north. Um, Anyway, so what happens? Okay, well, in 1688, um, a, a group of um, uh, sachems, this is, this is the beginning, the deed from the Indians to Adlord Bowd for the Governor Cox. Daniel Cox is the governor of West New Jersey, and he's got this guy, Adlord Bowd, negotiating for him to acquire what we now think of as Hopewell. And so this is the first few lines of the document. It says, to all people to whom these presents shall come. And then it lists a whole series of names of what are described as Indian Sakamakas, Indian leaders. And these guys have probably been brought down to Burlington Island uh, on the Delaware uh, to sign this deed, signing away the land of, um, of, of Hopewell. And this process is repeated over and over and over again. The predominantly English settlers of New Jersey were quite concerned that they had to show legal title to the land that they had, that they had to show that they had acquired it legally from the Indians. That's not to say that this was an equal transaction. It was not. It was not an equal transaction. Um, um, but the, uh, uh, these Sakamakas were negotiating and trying to get the best deal that they could for the groups of people that were in the area that were now having most of their rights uh, taken away from them. And this is what they got for Hopewell, which includes about, you know, close to a half of what we think of as Salem Mountain today. Um, a very interesting list, we can come to all kinds of, you can do all kinds of analysis of this to get a sense of how many um, people are involved, but let me just look at a highlight one, 20 kettles. Again, this is a female artifact, okay? The kettles are for cooking primarily. They do use them for other things as well, but, but primarily for cooking. So it represents a, a half, if you like, maybe an extended family. So possibly we are dealing with something like 20 extended families in Hopewell, not just on Salem Mountain, the whole of what we now think of as Hopewell and Ewing and multiply that by say five or six and you're getting to about a hundred and twenty maybe a hundred and forty people being represented by this so we're talking about uh, maybe between a hundred and 150 people living in the Hopewell area in 1688 American Indians now, obviously there's a lot of variables in that but it, it, it works various of these things work out 30 guns that would be one one gun for every adult male so you have um, maybe 20 heads of families and 10 young guys who also, I want a gun too, dad. Um, and, and so on. And uh, so these are giving you an idea of what the American Indians, these Lenape found of value to them 
um, and what they could get um, in return um, for the land. And one of the things they got, of course, were greatly improved tools over the ones that they were using. Um, um, iron and steel, steel, steel edged axes, tomahawks, we now think of them, again, made in Birmingham in England for the most part. Um, tremendously useful tool um, for cutting wood and cutting people's heads open and all kinds of uh, things like that. And um, although this isn't of course, Salem Mount and it's Hopewell Township. I just want to put some of the features of the landscape that we learn about from the deed and from the uh, later delineation of the boundaries of Hopewell Township. We have, when they're running along the boundary here, the boundary describers say, we're a little above Menapanascon. Here's Menapanascon. A little above it, they are up on the hill. Menapanascon's down in the Bedensbrook tributary. Uh, here's Wissam Minson. Route 31 and Route 654 and 518 are almost certainly Indian trails and there's a trail along the uh, along the Delaware as well. Uh, we get the names of some features, Laocolon Creek here at the point where the modern boundary which is the 1689 boundary does a little kink right there and there's a creek there and there's an abandoned bridge it's quite cool. And here is somebody, one of the Indians names, Atacoking. This is where Atacoking's wigwam was, right by the Delaware um, River. He's not in the deed. Here are the people who are actually uh, named in the deed itself. So he's a local guy who didn't get to do the negotiating. <clears throat> um, so this is, you know, obviously th there's, there's a sadness here to this. Um, it's not just uh, these people are suffering, they are, being affected by European diseases. Um, it's not a fair trade. Uh, and I know this is a bit fuzzy, but um, this, this is a, a, a fairly typical grievance that you hear from the Indians in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and everywhere else along the East Coast, um, expressing their different view of land and land ownership to the Europeans. Uh, they're complaining, you deal hardly with us. I mean, harshly. You claim all the wild creatures and will not let us come onto your land to hunt them, which they'd expected to do. Well, you know, we can still come and hunt, you know. You will not let us much as peel a single tree for bark, for canoes, or for anything else. This is hard and has given great offence. The cattle you raise are your own, your own cows, but those which are wild, the deer, are still ours or should be common to both of us. For when we sold the land, we did not propose to deprive ourselves of hunting the wild deer or using a stick of wood when we have occasion. We desire the governor to take this matter into his care and see that justice be done in it. Well, of course, it was not, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, that sort of brings us to the end. So I hope that's given you a sense of how we're starting, some of us are starting to think about Native Americans, American Indians, and Sal and Mountain and the areas around it. It's all very kind of early days in a way, um, but um, I think there's a lot more um, to be discovered and, and there's, there's a tremendous role for everyone who lives here to take part in that. It's not a sort of exclusive, um, here come the experts kind of thing. I mean, we, we can't I can't possibly survey the whole of Sale and Mountain and look for artifacts all over it. It's not going to happen. Um, but there's a, if a lot of people do, then that's going to be pretty neat. So um, I'm going to go back, I think, to the very first slide. Um, no, maybe, maybe I should stop the sharing. Should I stop the sharing now? Um, my email is on that first slide. Um, it's burrow into history, or one word, at gmail.com. Burrow into history. It's a joke. You get it? Burrow, burrow into history. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop sharing now and we can start um, with some question and answer and some discussion. <laughs>